everybody here this morning. Thank you for coming out on a rainy morning. Uh, we welcome our internet audience as well. Thank you for participating, whether you're watching it live or at some other time down the road. We thank you for joining us as uh, we study God's Word together. Uh, last week we touched on but now. We'll continue that this week. But again, we appreciate your participation and your, and your attendance. Uh, as we said last week, when anybody, whether it's me or pastor or somebody else, starts messing with tradition Hallelujah. or legalistic approach to the Word or anything outside of the message of grace, you can really sometimes stir up a hornet's nest. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't approach that, but you have to have a plumb line. You have to have a sound doctrine plumb line to compare to. Uh, if you don't have the plumb line or the true gospel, and I'm presenting the true gospel as Paul would say in this dispensation of grace, which is grace, and <clears throat> I'm going to take it a step farther and not only include grace, but pure grace, and then let's go another step farther and say 100% pure grace. In other words, without any mixture. Uh, you know, not this 99 and 64, 100% anything, but pure, 100% pure grace. When we start that, as our plumb line, how does our theology, how does our doctrine stack up against that plumb line? In Titus chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Truth which is after godliness is the only life, is the only way you can live a godly life in this dispensation. The word acknowledge that Paul uses in that scripture, acknowledging the truth which is after godliness, means that we have to admit sometimes things are true whether we want them to be true or not. Acknowledging truth which is after godliness. Can we admit and can we acknowledge Paul was given the task of getting people of his day and everybody that followed and reading the word after him of convincing those people that something had changed. There, that there was now a different truth acknowledging after godliness. Now, before Paul came along, the truth for godliness for the Jewish community obviously was the Mosaic Law. That was their truth that was given to the Jews, that was given to them as what they were to use as the truth after godliness 
to show them that they needed a Savior, which was to come. Not as a standard to live by, but to show them and get them to acknowledge, gee, man, I can't do this. I need somebody to do this for me. So that was the truth after godliness then. After the cross, Paul writes again, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, what is it now? It is grace. That is the truth which is after godliness today. Paul was made the apostle to the Gentile to get men to acknowledge whether they really wanted to accept it or not, but to get men to acknowledge that there had been a dispensational change. He uses the words by the unction of the Holy Spirit that we are in the dispensation of grace. So when we look at the dispensation of grace that we are in now, we must recognize and acknowledge that things changed at the cross. That there is not any more truth after godliness pertaining to the Mosaic law, but truth after godliness now pertains to grace and the indwelling Holy Spirit that tells us and guides us and directs us in our daily living. He is our administrative agent, not a set of lists, rules, regulations. Again, as we mentioned last week, everything changed at the cross. Not just the calendar, but everything, especially pertaining to Jesus, everything pertain everything change pertaining to the cross. Amen. The guilt of the and the tradition of the modern church is when we try to pull theology and doctrine that was relevant before Jesus died on the cross and tried to make that same theology and doctrine relevant after the cross. In the dispensation of grace, again, are we willing to acknowledge that everything changed? And if it did, how did it change? To what extent did it change? To what what effects did it have on Christendom? The hardest thing for the body of Christ to really accept is that the ministry of Jesus changed. Now the ministry of Jesus when he came was to the lost sheep of Israel. That was his words not mine. That was who he came to minister to, was to the lost sheep of Israel. That was his ministry. His mission was to go to the cross to die for sins of mankind. So Jesus of Nazareth is not Christ the Anointed One. We do not follow the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, we follow the ministry of Christ, the Anointed One. We do not follow in the dispensation of grace Jesus' earthly ministry. We have to follow His heavenly ministry that He dispensed to Paul by revelation according to the mystery that had been hidden. We do not follow Jesus of Nazareth after the flesh, but we follow the Spirit living within us. 
the earthly ministry of Jesus did not facilitate the living of his spirit within us. If you want that, you have to acknowledge the change that took place at the cross. And under this dispensation, Jesus' ministry changed. He now has a heavenly ministry to us in the form of grace instead of in the form of law. A persistent problem among Christians today is in reality, I'll speak for myself growing up, I was taught to believe what the clergyman said, what the pastor or the preacher said, what the Sunday school teacher said. That still exists. The problem is, we were not taught to believe what the verses said. Don't believe what I say. Be a Berean. According to Acts 17, study the scriptures daily. Believe what the verses say. Not what your pastor says, not what your Sunday school teacher says, not what some evangelist on TV says, anything like that. We have been taught and ingrained with, well, he's the pastor. We believe what the clergyman says. That's the reason we're in the shape we're in today. Believe what the verses say. Look them up. Believe what the verses say. As I've said before, the Bible is a progressive revelation. You've got to understand that Jesus didn't say everything he wanted to say in the book of Genesis. It kept progressing throughout. Uh, Jesus revealed to Paul this dispensation of grace. This is the but now. Paul uses that some 21 times in, in, in his epistles. Yada, 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 but now. So it is showing a severe change or shift in what used to be, what is relevant now. Until we can recognize and accept that everything changed at the cross, we will be attempting to pull things prior to the cross through the cross. And we will always end up in trouble. The kingdom gospel that was prevalent during Jesus' ministry ended at the cross. The dispensation of grace came on and the grace gospel, there was the shift but man, I will say religious man, did not want to change. Did not want to accept the change. Didn't want to accept the change then. Do not want to accept the change now. That is the battle that is still ongoing in the body of Christ. Do we accept this dispensation, dispensational shift and change that occurred when Jesus shed his blood, died for us on the cross. If we don't accept it, Galatians 2.21 says, Christ died in vain. Why did he go? Why did he give us the opportunity to believe in grace if we're going to reject it and keep living as the earthly ministry that Jesus had to the Jews. If we're going to adopt their theology that was for them and try to apply it to the dispensation of grace, Jesus died in vain. He didn't accomplish. And Paul did not accomplish in getting us to acknowledge that there was a change. 
the teaching of sound doctrine is to raise up knowledgeable believers that can do the work of the ministry in Ephesians 4. It is not the responsibility of the pastor to do the work of the ministry. It's a work, it's the responsibility of the pastor to equip the people that he is teaching to, to equip them with sound doctrine so then they can go forth and repeat sound doctrine to unbelievers. But if you're just going to repeat a bunch of commingled things, you're going to continue on a path that is detrimental to your spiritual growth as well as starting off somebody else on a path that will be detrimental to their spiritual growth. Uh, We cannot spiritually afford to keep the teaching that we acquired before we came to grace teaching. Think about that for a second. (coughs) We cannot afford to keep the teachings that we had, we grew up with, that we have, that has become such a tradition to us that is a mixture of Gospels, we cannot afford to keep those teachings if we're going to grow spiritually in the grace teaching. There must be a continual purging of our minds. Hebrews 12 says, renew your minds. And that the purging of our minds from this old teaching only comes by taking in sound biblical theology and sound biblical doctrine. That is the only way that the old teaching is going to be driven out. It has to be replaced by sound biblical doctrine. Has to be grace-based doctrine rightly divided. Now, as I started off with, when it comes to 100% pure grace. If that is our plumb line, if that is our standard, if, if that is what we use to determine how close we are to this plumb line or how far apart we are. One of the first things we have to do is we cannot have our own denominational biases as part of our grace movement. All of us came from different backgrounds, raised in different denominational teachings, different denominational statutes, regulations. But how do those teachings, how does our background and our tradition compare to 100% pure gospel of grace? Whatever does not line up with the pure gospel grace message, we need to get rid of it. We need to leave it. It's going to be hard. It's hard for me, hard for anybody I know of. But we have to compare our theology and our doctrine with the doctrine of grace or we will be like the Pharisees we will be religious but we will not have 
will, will be religious and theology poor. We won't be theology grounded. We will just be religious and have poor theology. So let's go through a couple of them. And I could go through 20 or 30 of them. But we'll hit the ones that uh, strike the nerves, I reckon, first. Uh, 90% of the Bible is written to the Jews. If you think about it. If you look at your Bible, 90% of this book is a Jewish book. It's only about 10% pertaining to dispensation of grace. If you start with Hebrews, I mean uh, Genesis chapter 12, all the way up to Acts chapter 7, is all history of Jews in Israel. In Romans through Philemon, you come up with the but now. Paul's but now, telling us what changed. In Hebrews through Revelation, it goes back to Jewish book. So you have... In your Bible, Genesis 12 through Acts 7, you have times past. Then you have Paul's but now. Then you have ages to come. So if we are to get our doctrine, and I'm a full believer that we should, if we are to get our doctrine from Paul's epistles, as we will read in a second, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, teach no other doctrine. In other words, teach no other doctrine but the grace doctrine. Galatians 1, he would say, you're under a double curse if you are. When it comes to theology and doctrine... This is all we use to get our theology and doctrine. 